all so much for joining our panel. I am so excited for this conversation. I am here with four incredible leaders, four women who I've had such a pleasure of getting to be a part of their career journey to the top, and four women who've been such important sponsors to me over the years. Today's conversation is going to be grounded in work that my firm does. I'm Dr. Julia Rafel Bear. I'm the CEO of ILO Group. We are a woman-founded, woman-led policy and strategy firm. We work with district and state education leaders and organizations that are helping those leaders to be as successful as possible with their biggest bets. One of the things that we're known for are the research and insights we put out around what's happening in the top 500 largest districts in the country. To put in perspective, those are districts that touch 16,000 students all the way up to New York City. In these insights, what we've found is that for the better part of the last decade, we've seen a complete stagnation in the percent of women in that top leadership role. We've hovered at 30% for a decade. Since the start of the pandemic, more than half of those top 500 districts saw turnover, 10% turned over multiple times. It could have been an opportunity to see many more women in those top roles, but it's not what we saw. It was a one-way street gender-wise. Every time that a man left his job, seven out of 10 times, he was replaced by a man. Every time a woman left her job, seven out of 10 times, she was replaced by a man. The rest of our research pointed out that women are also being paid $25 to $30,000 less than men for doing the exact same job. And at the state level, it's 40%. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to change. And we're here to talk about some of those solutions. These ladies are going to drive the conversation. But I want to just start by sharing my own journey with sponsors. Sponsorship is something that we don't talk as much about. Big businesses and corporations have spent billions of dollars on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. There is not an industry out there that has figured out what to do about this problem of not having enough women actually getting into those top roles and, and retaining there. We think one of the reasons is because it keeps focusing on mentorship. We're here to talk about why that's going to be inadequate. Sponsors play a real hands-on role in shaping careers. They use their power to open up seats at the table, and they speak on your behalf when you are not in those rooms to make sure that you are constantly being talked about and vouched for. When I was Assistant Commissioner of Education in New York State, John King was an incredible sponsor to all of us. Constantly opened up his Rolodex, knocking down doors. I still get text messages all the time. People are in meetings. Like, John says I should be a superintendent. I should talk to you. And that's what John does all the time. Each of these women are going to share with you some of their own experiences and how they're creating cultures in their organizations that really emphasize sponsorship. I'm going to start with Margaret. Over to you. You've been known in your leadership for creating the kinds of conditions for failing forward, and that's been really important to you in Laramie. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and what that looks like for you? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Julia. Good afternoon, everybody. Margaret Crespo. Um, I am the superintendent in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, which is a very isolated area uh, compared to other places in the country. And when I arrived to Cheyenne, I recognized this incredible need to really look at leadership differently. To begin with, um, my parents immigrated from Cuba, so I have this whole generational debt that I owe to family. And part of that process for me is to always make sure that when I fail, which I fail a lot, that I fail forward. Um, and I've brought that to the district where I am right now. A lot of the work that has been done is trying to redefine leadership after the pandemic, while we're trying to grow our own in a community that really does not have that depth of um, population. There just aren't more than 100,000 people in a capital city. So what we've tried to do is develop systems where it doesn't matter what your leadership position is anywhere in the organization, you're given the opportunity to fail forward. So recommending people for sponsorship opportunities, for trainings, we have um, even our cabinet has to learn um, skills and things that they perhaps have never been exposed to. So as an example, <clears throat> We do our work with our professional learning, and all of the cabinet members have to go through that same process. So whether it's they're getting their rings through Apple or they're having to be trained in CPR, whatever it is that we're expecting, so that they understand they never lose the footing of the importance of what it's like to be in any one of those positions. On the flip side, we talk to people throughout the organization on a regular basis. Um, I remember the first time I went into the warehouse, the person walked up to me and said, I've worked here for 33 years and I've never met the superintendent. 
And I said, that's a problem. Like, what ideas do you have? How do we grow? What can we do more, better, faster? Because you are in that role. So we very strategically focused on that redesign and how we bring everyone up to the opportunity to be at the table and have a conversation about their job and what their aspiration for what their life might look like. Students, which we'll talk a little bit more about here, students and other adults in the system, including community. Thank you. Kyla, I want to bring you in on this. Um, Kyla is the longest serving superintendent that Oakland has ever had. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it's a district, Kyla, you started off your career as a teacher. You went all the way to the top, but you've shared often, and I'd love for you to share with this group about the role that sponsors played, especially when you didn't even think you could apply for that job. Can you talk a little bit about sponsors in your career? Yes, um, so the last, first of all, the last thing I thought I was gonna be doing is going into education. My mother was in education, my grandmother was in education. Um, so sometimes I always say, for those of you who are spiritual in the, in the room, the Lord works in mysterious ways. So I ended up being in education, and similarly, um, the, the thought of being a superintendent was the last thing that crossed my mind. Um, but I kept having people when um, the former superintendent transitioned to say, you know, you should apply, you should apply. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to apply, you know, as crazy as Oakland is, it always has lots of people who apply. I was like, I'm not going to get it. This will be a good practice. And so one of my sponsors was like, first of all, don't you ever in a public space say you are interviewing for practice. And I was like, okay, you are going to rehearse, you are going to research, you are going to get this job. And I was like, okay, you know, applied, unbeknownst to me, did get it. Um, but what was great was having one of the former superintendents actually walk me through, um, one, here is the number for who to call to negotiate your contract. And just conversation after conversation, we met every week um, for free. He would coach me um, for a week, just breaking down, um, I think the political piece of the job, which I think is one of the most challenging and helping me to um, understand how to navigate. Um, three was just actually opening up that Rolodex to specific folks that I needed, funders, right? So that I could keep some of the philanthropic investments going. Um, to other superintendents in California who knew lots of folks at the state. And so if the time that it would have taken for me on my own to develop those relationships, even if I knocked hard enough, right, would those doors have opened? I'm not sure if they would have opened, if I would have had to do that all on my own. So I think sponsorship and this notion that you are aware of the privilege that you have you're aware of the ease that sometimes you may have when you're in spaces and you see talent and you see that the talent may not have that ease, right, of access and privilege. And so you're intentionally opening up those doors, knocking down those barriers, and then you're just transferring and sharing the information. Without that, I, I know for a fact that I still wouldn't be sitting in the seat. And so it was extremely um, important um, and before moving on, I will say for all of us, I mean, there's not one person in this room who isn't leading and having some folks beneath them or who look up to you. And so just the importance in small ways of, of what you're doing to kind of crack that door open to folks who are working with you and who desire to be where you are now in two to three years. Um, it's the small things done consistently that really make the transformational change that, that brings us all here today. Thank you. Christina, you are a political powerhouse in Washington, D.C. these days, not a city that you started off your career in. You were hand-selected by your mayor to lead education for her enormous weight. And you've gotten there in a career that has been incredible and one that has had a number of different sponsors, particularly men, who've played really important roles. Can you talk about the role that men played as sponsors? And now for you, as you think about your tenure in DC, what are you doing to set the conditions for other women? It's such an important dynamic. Um, I 
Hi, hello, I'm Christina Grant. I'm the state superintendent of Washington, D.C. Um, and I wrote my dissertation on black women in the superintendency. And so I had the great fortune of fanning out. I mean, the first time I met Kyla on a Zoom screen, I couldn't believe she was talking to me. I said, oh, hello. And then um, if I defended my dissertation on May 3rd, I became a state superintendent on June 21st. So that's how fast it happened. But one of, my one of my findings was every single woman I interviewed, I interviewed 15 superintendents. They each said that it was a man that told them, keyword, told them that they were going to be a superintendent and then hand walked them through the process. And so when you step back and you wonder why are there less women in leadership, we have to stop creating barriers for each other. There are so many districts across this country that need us leading and loving on our children. We lead differently, we make decisions differently. I'm sorry to the men in the room. In many instances, we are better. Um, <laughs> and we're loyal. And so I've been really deliberate and in some ways unapologetic about shifting the dynamic that exists, shifting from an all boys club that we know exists, where they are saying, I'm not gonna go for the role because you should go for the role. I'm gonna make sure I call this person so that they know X, Y, and Z. We have to create space for women to navigate to this seat with a fan of people behind them because this is politics. I tell individuals that in all respects, I am a politician, I just have one area of focus, which is education. I don't have to be good at anything else. And you have to acknowledge the superintendency isn't just about teaching and learning, that's the core, but if you don't have the relationships, the political fortitude, the wherewithal, you can't run this race. And women have to lean into this. It's like when someone says, well, I'm, mad, I'm bad at math. No one ever says I'm bad at reading. But women consistently will say, I'm a good number two. In fact, when I worked for Bill Hyatt in Philadelphia, that was my moniker. I was like, I'm a great number two. Watch me run this board meeting. I'm gonna sit in the back of the room. I'm gonna have all the answers. And he can just sit in the chair. And then he said, no, 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 you can sit in the chair. And so now, across my core team, my leadership team is, Danielle, are you in here? I don't see her. My new deputy suit for academics, we just promoted. She's exceptional. And we have to be unapologetic about sponsorship, which I'm really grateful that we're grounding this conversation in the space between mentorship and sponsorship. Mentorship is, hey friend, it'd really be great if you showed me your resume and told me how you, that's not sufficient. Sponsorship is, this role is available. I'm gonna introduce you to everybody on their board. Come show up at this place at this time, don't even speak. Just bring a notepad and write what you say. And then when you walk out the room, I'm gonna say, did you meet Margaret? She's exceptional. Love her so much, she's so great. Let me tell you about all the work, because I'm gonna spend my political capital on you. And the key to that, don't mess up someone's political capital. And so if someone is going to sponsor you, you hold on to that for dear life. And I would say that I'm sitting here because I'm really good at loving all my sponsors, making them proud. Every single step I take is a reflection of what they poured into me. And I can't stop talking without acknowledging that my first year assistant principal is in the front room. So when I became a teacher 20 years ago, in my classroom, lighten me up. <laughs> Get that bulletin board better. This lesson plan isn't good enough. Make it better. Stop wearing your hair like that put on a suit, you look 12, <laughs> but I mean, it's true, but sponsorship, 20 years later, still here. And there are several other names. There are people in this room who have seen me every part of my career. Sponsorship, are you humble enough to listen? Are you humble enough to do it again? When they tell you to sit down, stop talking, will you do that? those people will invest in you and they'll see you all the way here. And when I fail, they will be the people in the room when I'm not in the room saying, no, you're not gonna come for our superintendent. Not today, not tomorrow. Yep, she made a mistake. Yep, that was wrong, but she's ours. And that's the full continuum of what it means to, to run this type of race. Thank you. Susanna, I wanna bring you in on this. Susanna, you had an incredible 
incredible journey. You were the student in the school district that you then went on to become the CEO of. You went all the way up from teacher all the way to superintendent, did an incredible job, and you're now running networks of superintendents around the country. You're getting to see firsthand what this new generation is grappling with every single day. What are some of the ways that you think sponsorship could play a role as you're seeing out in these patterns across the country? Yeah, thank you, um, and thank you for that. It, um, I have to say first, like it is so inspiring to look out at this room filled with people who believe in the power of female leadership. Um, it kind of gives me goosebumps, and so I just I had to start by saying that. Um, you know, I think, sadly, that what I hear from women, both number ones and number twos, um, are the same sort of things that women have grappled with for a long time. It's like, how do you balance being a good parent and being a good leader? Um, it's how do you have the grace um, to spend the time that you need to. Um, I think, honestly, mostly it's people are spending more time at work than they are at home and feeling a tremendous amount of guilt um, around that. Um, and I think what we need to do as sponsors is both help people think about how to change that dynamic, but also give people permission to focus where they need to focus at the time that they need to focus on it. Um, and, you know, when you're in the middle of some big crisis at work, uh, it's going to be hard to take the time to, you know, pick your kids up from school, which means at some other point in time you need to be able to give yourself the grace to take off early and go do that. Um, you're, you know, I think it's really, really tough. Um, and what sponsors can do is sponsors can help show the way of balancing in a place where there really isn't any uh, ability to get the kind of balance uh, that we're really looking for. Um, and I think it's also really important for sponsors to help um, particularly women as they're thinking about that next step up to replace the negative voice in their head. Um, I think women in particular really uh, are hard on themselves, uh, really um, tell themselves uh, all the things that they can't do. There's so much research about men who will apply for jobs when they meet half of the criteria and women who check almost all of them and still think that they can't do it. Um, and I think sponsors need to help women see themselves the way others see them and not through their own eyes because we tear ourselves down, and sadly, I think sometimes we tear each other down. Um, and I think it's really important that what sponsors do is lift people up um, and help them see themselves much, much, much more accurately. Thank you, Susanna. One of the things I wanna um, go back to is something, Christina, you were saying about the importance of being in a room where your sponsor speaks on your behalf and knows exactly what they need to share about you. We know that one of the reasons that gets cited for why people don't end up having sponsors is that people say that they didn't feel like they really knew what they were about. They didn't understand their track record. They didn't really know how to share on their behalf. And a lot of that comes down to authenticity. Your authenticity as a leader matters so much for a sponsor to be able to use their power. They need to know what your track record is. They need to know what those examples are. And they need to know who you are. Margaret, you've had um, a particularly um, strong focus on authentic leadership, and you have a pretty pro provocative perspective on it. Can you share a little bit about your views? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that I recognized coming out of the pandemic, you know, a lot of people talked about this loss of learning. And what really came out across for me very clearly was um, suddenly we had been exposed. We hadn't been exposed in all the things that you're thinking. So how many of you remember when, as a teenager, you recognized that perhaps your parents or the adults that were in charge of you didn't really know everything? <laughs> so what I realized that the pandemic revealed was that our kids are on to us. They absolutely fully recognize that we're full of it, <laughs> right? We could not navigate a global pandemic without losing it. We were not able to pivot from our toes to, from our heels to our toes in a second to be able to make it a comprehensive system for them. And when it really came to light for me, I was sitting in a very contentious parent meeting um, and this parent started crying in a room full of people and said, you know, I, I've been trying to tell my child how amazing this experience is and how wonderful it's gonna be. And, and she's like crying. And she said, and I can't, I can't do this. 
And I looked at her, and my cabinet almost died. Like, I said, stop lying. And my team was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> because I always, that's the way I show up, right? The reality for me is you get to, you, you'll never see anything different. This is just the way I show up. And here's this parent crying because she's trying to convince her child that life is Skittles and rainbows. And the reality is that if they bought that story, they don't now because they watched us try to figure it out. And we try to convince them that everything is amazing and life is great. And we wonder why we have a social emotional crisis in our country around mental health. Our kids are struggling, our adults are struggling because we keep trying to live in this experience in this time that does not exist. So part of the leadership and authenticity for me is meeting with kids and explaining to them and their parents and the community that it's okay to struggle. And it's not just about belly breaths, right? It's hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. And you have to recognize when you're in that space how to move past that and that it's okay for your kids, for your students to not be able to experience happiness all the time. So one of the things that we did, we started a program in our community, we trained 375 adults, firefighters, law enforcement, hospital, mental health providers, in the common vocabulary. I didn't start by burdening teachers. I started by burdening the community. You want a different situation, then you have to step up to the plate and do so. So we trained about 360 adults to be ambassadors, then we trained kids, then we trained teachers and parents. And it has been the largest shift I've seen in our community in the time that I've been there and beyond. Because they have a common vocabulary, they're accepted, students are accepted for their voice and listened to. And when they are triggered by other adults or there are things that are not going well for them, it's okay for us as adults to say, it's really hard work, but we're gonna do it together. 60 seconds on authentic leadership. One, your career follows you. So like, this is my 20th year. You can't fake it for 20 years. So you have no choice but to be you. This is me. You can talk to anyone in this room that knows me. They're like, yep, Christina gonna show up with a red lip. She gonna have on a suit. If you talk about her boss, she gonna go off on you. Like, it's all the things. Cause I, I, know, I'm, I know who I'm loyal to. I work for the mayor of Washington DC. You don't like her, that's your problem. But she is my boss and I'm very loyal, right? And so in terms of authentic leadership, people know when a school shooting happens, the superintendent's gonna show up. If a bus crash happens, she's gonna show up. Like, she's gonna run into the problem, and she expects excellence. If you're gonna be on her team, this is what it means to be on her team. If you don't wanna be on her team, here's the door. But you have to be clear that you can't fake it. So whoever you are, and however you show up, lean into that. Because my face is on the news or something every single day, and you will mentally become undone if you are trying to shape shift to who wants to like you today. Let your work be excellent. Let your yeses be yeses and your noes be few. And be loyal to the people that brought you into the room. Like, that's authentic leadership. Because when you aren't in the room, like when I walk out, everyone is gonna have a story about who you are, but it's the people who've seen you lead, that's the voice that's gonna carry you. Kyla, I'd like to hear um, from you a little bit on this one. And one thing I was thinking about listening to what Christina was just sharing. Tell us about how you're now coaching and mentoring around this too within your own organization. How do you have those kinds of tough conversations, particularly with other women, about how to show up in, in this authentic leadership way? Yeah, I would say first, you know, as a woman and as a person of color, just accept that still in 2023, you gotta work harder, period. And so that is more stress, right? Microaggressions are real. So kind of to go back to Socrates, you have to hella know yourself and you have to love yourself. And that's, a, that's ongoing work. So, you know, getting clear about your rituals and your routine, in your routines to be clear on who you are, what are your core values, what are you about, what are you absolutely not going to stand for, where are you okay bending? Because you can't be in these roles and not have to have some kind of flexibility to get done what you're trying to do on behalf of students and families in your system. But that is so important because when you're doing equity work, you should make people upset. Mm -hmm. If everybody is liking you, you're not doing shit, excuse my French, for kids. <laughs> so it's a skill set to learn how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? with hearing the truth about how your system is, may, may not be serving everyone, 
and you know, you are the face of the system that historically has not served students and families. So people are gonna be upset. You have to practice getting comfortable with that. You know, one of the things one of my um, sponsors told me is that people don't follow systems, they follow people, right? We're trying to build coalitions because we're doing very little. We're trying to set the conditions and galvanize folks to do the work. But so people, the authenticity is about people seeing, are you real? And that really happens when stuff goes down, right? Whether it's dealing with a strike, dealing with whatever it is, right, that causes people to split, to have differences of opinion, people pay attention to how you lead, right? How you have to deliver bad news, how you have to make tough decisions. Do you throw people under the bus? Are you honest with people? All of those things, that helps to build your reputation, it helps to build that you are someone that can be trusted, it helps to build that people feel that you are competent, and that when you leave the room, right, when you go from position to position to position, and people talk about something you did five years ago, and there's consistency in terms of your leadership, that is important. So I think to me, at the end of the day, it's you really understanding who you are. And even as you're picking your leadership seat, is it a good match for who you are as a leader and what you want to do in your own core values? And doing the work ongoing, right, to get just clear and more comfortable, right, in, in who the person that, that you are. And again, I'll just underscore as a first, the first black woman, African-American, Latina, you know, you have to be so clear about who you are because you, you will be tested, right? And when you aren't clear, that's when the politics can consume you and cause you to kind of like navigate to whatever the latest wins are. Yeah. Our I Like Your Research has called out this stubborn gap and we've been trying to really look at other sectors and to figure out what can we be learning? And one of the things that we notice is how much the media seems to just keep celebrating what feels like participation trophies. The Fortune 500 companies hit the 10% mark and the Wall Street Journal went crazy applauding themselves over it. Right after that, Rockefeller Foundation did a survey and asked Americans whether they thought that it was more likely that humans would colonize Mars or that we would get to 50% of Fortune 500 companies led by women. One in four Americans believes we will sooner colonize Mars than we will get to 50% of Fortune 500 companies led by women. One in four Americans believes that. I feel like it's sort of t-ball time these days with the media and the way they've been. And Christina, I'm curious, how do we get out of this? How do we get real about how we're really going to elevate and promote more women? I mean, one is sessions like this and, you know, coming together. Um, we have to do, uh, Ironetta is the superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools, and I always um, shout her out because Ironetta is unapologetic about telling her story of leadership. If she is at a school, it's going to be on LinkedIn. If she is in a difficult, she's going through a difficult situation, she's going to drive that narrative. She's going to tell her story. You're not going to get ahead of her. And that's what the male CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are doing. They are obsessed about their brand, their message, they're writing op-eds, they, like, they are doing the groundwork. And I think with women, we focus so much on doing our job. Like we, we wanna write the perfect memo, we wanna have a great policy, right? And in this role, we have to be, and, and I think by design, or at least I'd speak for myself, I wasn't good at self-promotion. I wasn't good at saying, no, I've negotiated union contracts. I've written, I've redesigned assessments. I've reported, like, it's not, it wasn't in me. And, and in order to shift this paradigm, women have to be clear about, I did this thing and I was exceptional. Let me tell you about it. Now let me tell you again. Now you go tell your cousin, I'm really great at my job. And I've learned to say that. And I feel like, Julia, you've seen that shift where folks will say like, oh my gosh, Christine, I'm like, yes, I'm a great superintendent. I'm exceptional at it, in fact. But that's, those are words that for a whole host of reasons, right? Culturally, I was never trained to talk that way. From my faith, 
I'm never trained. Like, cause it, particularly as a black woman, we believe that like, if it gets too good, bad is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you were culturally raised to be like, no, no, I'm not gonna say, because the bad thing is coming. Well, guess what? The bad thing is always gonna come, but you could tell a good story about yourself while you're going. <laughs> it's always gonna be there. The board meeting is coming, but, but you, should, <laughs> you should sell what you're doing well and, and, start, and I think, to me, honestly, like seeing the way some men self-promote when, when you scratch the surface, you're like, you didn't even do that work. That wasn't even you. It was probably a woman. It was probably a woman. It was probably, it was one of us. Even in, even in the superintendency, even in the superintendency, the, the people who get heralded as the best at this work they are not the best superintendents. But we don't, and I name this all the time, Essence Magazine doesn't profile the top black superintendents in this country. We don't, we don't, media does not profile us. And so how do we create systems and structures where we are celebrating ourselves, where we're on the who's to watch list so that people are flocking at our door? I, and I, I think it starts with us, but it's culturally that by design, we, we, don't, we don't do it enough. And that's work that I know I have to do and, and others have to do in order to, and I would say make room, right? There are a ton of superintendent vacant positions right now, and we have to be running ground game for each other. We need to be, when the board is having the vote, it needs to be a bench of women in the front row. Like, I dare you to take a wrong vote. <laughs> like, you know, when I'm having a rough time, mystically a social media campaign starts where all the folks are like, oh, no, 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 look over here, the superintendent's great. Don't worry about that. We have to do that work so that our brand remains strong so that people can't take us out. And I just think that men, particularly in corporate America, are exceptional at that. Southwest Airlines, like completely imploded over the holidays. <laughs> CEO is like, we're so great, we're so sorry. You know, we had a rough time, but there was no massive rally cry for him not to lead anymore. We have to have that same grace and space for women in leadership, and we have to protect each other. Julia, can I, can I also yeah. just jump in? I think it's also really important to, to recognize it is a different job to be the number two and to be the number one. And it is fundamentally a different job. And like getting your head around the skills that you have that made you great at your job are transferable skills, but they are not the same things. And you've really got to let go of the things that maybe you loved doing because it's no longer your job. The, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is when we get into the space, we also need to be courageous to transform the space into the leadership that fits a woman, right? Yes. Like one of the pieces of research is the fact that so many women won't even apply or step into the role because they're a mom because they're caring for others. So to me, when we have the privilege of being in the space, I'm like, F it, I'm going to model how to do this and be a mom. So I don't have a problem when I'm on Zoom, I'm laying edges on my daughter's hair while I'm facilitating the meeting. And for me, it's intentional because I'm trying to show other women, if this is something that you want, you can figure out a way to make it work for you. I will leave a board meeting and tell my board I've got to go to my son's science you know, class or event. I'll be there 30 minutes and I will come back. Because the more you do it, the more you normalize that there is another way to work. That's the other advantage of us being in the position. And trust me, other women look and see. Mm -hmm. If they see that you're taking permission to leave early, to do things, you're giving permission to hundreds and thousands of women in your organization to say, oh, I can reimagine. I'm still giving 100%, but I am going to make sure my family is not always gonna be an afterthought if you want me to stay. And again, if I'm doing the work, people will make the allowances and allow you to do. And so I think that is crucial as a woman in these roles uh, because that is a barrier if folks constantly feel like I've gotta put everything aside and sacrifice. 
of course you're not gonna have people decide to be in the positions. And if they do, of course you're only gonna get folks for a couple of years. So that is a responsibility, I think, when we're in these seats to be able to do as well. And can I say one more thing? Pay somebody to do your laundry. Like, you don't need to do your Pay own laundry. Pay someone to do everything. When you're the superintendent. <laughs> Outsource everything. You don't need to go to a grocery store. It's not important. But, Susanna, can you just share... Massage you share, at your house. Can you share with them what you were sharing with me about relationship and partnership? Because I do think it's important to name. It's also a huge sacrifice in the totality of your life. And you, you know yeah. you've been married so for 30 I'm years. Celebrating 30 years this August. So I'm very, very proud of that. Um, my husband also has a very, very important job. And there are two things that I think really contributed to our very long-lasting, happy relationship. I usually joke it's low expectations, but it's not that. <laughs> it's that life is not a movie. Like, you're not going to have your life where it's like this perfect story arc, where there's a challenge and then it gets resolved and then, like, nope, it's, life is not a movie. You just got to be okay with the messiness. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, the best advice somebody gave me was, you have to decide, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And I can tell you, like, there were plenty of times when I thought I was right, but I wasn't happy. And I much prefer being happy than I prefer being right. So I think it's important to add, as we're supporting each other and helping each other and modeling, it's really important to teach those around us who perhaps don't know, right? I'm the first female, I'm the first Latina in superintendency in, in the district I'm in. And, and what's really interesting is there are those that want me to be successful and want other women around me to be successful. But I often have to pause when they say, such and such has been out a lot because, you know, she's got a daughter. And I'm like, and who takes your child to the doctor's appointment? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, let's teach you how to respond that way. And I think we forget that because we assume that everyone should know. But ultimately, all of us are responsible for making sure that everybody learns what's expected, how do we do this together, with no judgment. It's okay that you don't understand what it's like to go inside a doctor's office with your child, but we're gonna show you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, lightning round. <laughs> Lightning round. I each of you so much. <laughs> in 45 seconds or less, um, what does the next evolution of sponsorship look like? Let's start down with you, Kyla. I think the next evolution of sponsorship looks like everybody in this room has a capacity to be a sponsor, like I said in the very beginning. Who looks up to you, right? Who are you grooming? Equity sometimes is about folks having more time to get to where they need to go. So the position right before you, in some ways, is too late, right? When folks are entering the system, I mentor, I have students that are like, I want to be able to do that at some point. Well, come on, let's start the journey in terms of what it is you think you want to be doing. So some of it as a systems leader is how you're building systems where that's an expectation as part of evaluation. You're holding people accountable, but you're also helping people to actually get to the next place that they want to go and helping them to see sometimes the brilliance that they may not see in themselves. That's real diver diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so it's obviously whatever someone's doing for all of us, we're paying it back, but now that we are in, in charge of organizations, that we're trying to build systems, so that just becomes the norm of what happens, because that's how we get to the type of impact that we want. Susanna? Um, I would say it's like staying in touch. It's the... Um, a woman I knew as a teacher just recently um, joined the organization that I work in now. She made it from teacher to teacher leader to assistant principal to principal. Um, and I think it's always about like staying in touch with those talented people and helping them connect to the next opportunity. Yeah, I'll be really quick. I think it's doing it in partnership with others. And so like two of my closest sponsors in DC are right here, Rachel and Raina. Um, and we come together regularly to figure out how we block and tackle for each other and how we bring folks along. And so like when someone has had a misstep, we're like, come, have a seat, let's have lunch. Mm. Um, and so the sponsorship works when you're doing it alongside people you trust. They're blocking and tackling for you and then we're creating space for others to do the work as well. And it's important to note that we're all women. And so we don't let, no offense to men, but we don't let men in that space because there's certain work that can only be done in and amongst each other. And I would just add for me, it's network, elevate, and answer the phone. 
So it doesn't matter if, I, if you got my cell phone number, I don't care if it's two in the morning, I'm gonna answer the phone because you never really know the crisis um, and that helps you elevate the, the person that you're working with, student, adult, it doesn't matter. Last comment. If any of you women in the room are thinking, I could do this, you can do this, give us a follow at Women Leading Ed. It's a new national network for aspiring and sitting women superintendents. I have had the pleasure of getting to support ladies in their career, 41 superintendents I've helped in their journey to become district and state superintendents. <laughs> Who's next in this room? They'll tell you, you, don't, you can't say no. Just keep, keep moving you along, but, but seriously, think about it, and we hope to see you on your journey soon. Thank you to our panelists.